Well, good morning, church. So glad to see you here. Uh, welcome. Glad you could join us. I'd invite you to stand as we get ready to worship our God this morning. Uh, we get ready just to fill this room with our praise and with our voices, just singing out, uh, rejoicing in the, in the joy that we have because of Jesus Christ and the joy of what he's done for us on the cross. So let us just worship him together this morning. From where I'm standing, 
morning. Heavenly Father, just so much rejoice in those words that we get to sing. Why should we fear? The evidence is here and it's clear that you are with us. You are a God who is for us and you are a God who is good. So Father, this morning we rejoice. We lift up those words. We declare that we know you are seated on your throne over all and you are a good God. Father, I pray for each one of those in this room that maybe those words come really easy today. Maybe they can see so easily and so readily all of the good that is in their lives because of you. And so, Father, uh, we praise you and we rejoice with those who are rejoicing this morning. We worship you for who you are and for what you've done. Uh, But God, I know that a song like this, there's also moments and seasons in life for all of us where maybe these words are a little bit more difficult to sing. Maybe these words don't come out quite so easily so, Father, I pray that in those seasons, we would still choose to make that declaration. We would still choose to acknowledge that you are on your throne and that you are good. Father, in each and every season of life, in each and every way that you work, we know there is goodness to come of it if we turn towards you, if we submit to Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, Father, I pray this morning that that would be what we're able to do, is we're able to just submit to Jesus Christ, to rejoice in the goodness many, many blessings you give us and to rejoice even more so in just who you are, just to rejoice here in your presence this morning. What an opportunity to worship you. 
So Father, we just pray that you'd be glorified here in our midst. Speak to us now as we continue worshiping you in song and prayer and through the study of your word. God, just be exalted amongst, amongst us in our praise this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hi, I'm Darla Beal. I'm the director of the Brookings County Youth Mentoring Program, and I'd like to invite all of you to consider making a difference in the life of a K-12 through grade student in the county. Brookings County Youth Mentoring Program exists to help fill relational voids that kids experience. So we come alongside, we provide support, we challenge growth, and we expand possibilities for youth in our community. If you were interested, and you might have seen that we had a training last week, that's okay if you weren't able to attend that one. We can train new mentors year-round. It doesn't require any special training or any special gifts, just a willingness to serve and be a friend to a youth who might need another adult caring person. BCYMP trains all our mentors in the Developmental Relationships Framework from Search Institute, and what we find is that the mentors also grow. It's a bi-directional relationship, so you will also grow from serving and being a mentor. So reach out to us if you'd like to learn more. Our address is bcymentoring.org, or you can call our office at 697-0444. Thank you. Good morning. Ooh, that was that was better than first service, but we're going to try again. Good morning. There we go. This is second service. Come on, you're awake. You've had coffee. That's good to see you this morning. Uh, like that said, uh, like like she, like that said, like she said, have I had coffee? No. Uh, <laughs> if if you would are interested in that, jump on their website, and there's ways you can uh, get connected there. There is a mentoring application on their website, and they have op also have options to do the mentor training online. So you don't have to even go somewhere. You can do that. Um, all online. Um, and this is one of those opportunities. Every week uh, we talk here about encountering grace, growing grace, and then becoming grace givers. And there is really no better way that to be a grace giver and then to mentor one of our youths. And, so, and like she said, I think, and it's true in my life, when you serve in that way, you also grow yourself. And I see that as I teach the kids and, and I grow uh, when I teach and I'm around them. I just love it. Uh, so if you have any inkling and you want to get connected, I encourage you to jump on their website. Um, also, uh, up here every week we have 605, 609, 1060. That is a way you can text something to that number. Anything you want. I even told first servers you can text ice cream to that. And maybe, just maybe, ice cream will come your way. I don't know. But you should try. But if you want to get connected, pray, give, connect, or talk to somebody about Jesus. Those are all ways that we want you to get the things you need. Probably not ice cream, but I, I do encourage you to try. Uh, and then the community life team is going to be mad at me in a minute. <laughs> we don't have ice cream. Um, also, a reminder, uh, third service, um, we now have, ever, since COVID shut down, uh, since things shut down for COVID, uh, we shut down our third service kids programs. And just last week, we started those up again. So we have those available again. So third service from nursery through third grade, we have programs for our kids. Um, so if you're a parent and you uh, are interested in jumping in on that third service, that's a great place to do that. Also, um, if you'd like to be a grace giver, we also need some people to jump in, whether you want to hold babies or teach kids or just jump around and be crazy. We need some uh, people to jump in on that ser third service to help. And then finally, uh, this red book is Practical Christianity. Steve started this series last week. Is what we're going to be going through all fall as we look at some parts of the book of Romans. And uh, a lot of our growth groups are jumping in on this. And so I encourage you to pick one up as you go out. You can do it on your own or if you're part of a growth group or if you haven't yet joined a growth group, you can still do that. You can sign up in the foyer on our computers uh, or you can contact the church and we'll get you connected. All right, good to see you this morning. I'll invite Pastor Steve up. Good morning. It's great to see you. Good morning to those of you joining us online. I know I say that every week, but we're so grateful that you're part of our church this morning and we value and are thankful that you're watching us through that uh, media uh, 
opportunity. So today we're on our second message uh, from our series entitled Practical Christianity. And in this series, we're looking at Romans chapter 13, 14, and 15, and going through basically verse by verse. And last week, as we begin this study, uh, we looked into the topic of authority and submission, and we only looked at verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 13. Well, today we're going to continue that, that topic of authority and submission, and we're going to look at Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, and we're going to get a little bit more detailed and a little bit more uh, practical this morning. So listen to the scripture. It's Romans 13, and I'm going to read to you now verses 1 uh, through 7. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll be amended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, than honor. So we are into some what I would consider more difficult scripture. It's easy to kind of blow this off and say, well, that doesn't apply to me, that doesn't apply, uh, this is you know, not reasonable. But you have to remember that Paul penned these words of instruction under very ungodly authorities, way worse than we're experiencing today, amen? So if it worked then, It works now. Amen? And so we have to grapple with what does this mean and how do we apply it? Well, what Paul's doing here, I think, is articulating um, in a concise manner a huge biblical principle of submission. So let me give you this review point from last week. This is basically all we talked about last week. Romans 13 reveals a principle that is illustrated throughout the Bible. The follower of God who submits to authorities often experiences the power of God. So the one who submits to those in authority often puts themselves in a favorable position to really experience a movement of God in their circumstances. So really what Paul's doing for us here in Romans 13 is this, in a concise manner, in a brief statement, articulating this huge biblical concept. Just think of all the examples of the Bible that really illustrate this, this principle out. I shared about some of these last week. If you weren't here last week, I highly recommend you listen to that message and hear about these examples. But just think about these examples of people who understood the power of submission. Uh, Joseph understood that. We talked about him last week. He understood what it was to serve his authorities and to bless his authorities. Moses, he was known as the most humble man on the earth. He understood what it meant to serve God and to serve authorities. Then you had King David. He initially served under the ungodly uh, rulership of Saul, who tried to kill him. But David would not touch the anointed of God. Then you got Daniel and friends. They were literally taken captive by uh, the Babylonians and taken to a new place to live. Yet they served in the courts of the king as unto God. They understood the power of submission. And then there was a couple of women. I didn't even talk about these ones. Esther and Ruth, when we talked about Esther last summer, but I want to talk with you for just a couple moments as a way of kind of getting us thinking together on Ruth's example of the power of, of submission to authorities. Um, the book of Ruth is super short. I would really recommend you read it. It's all short. It's such a good, it's a little gem in the back of the New Testament. It just is, you read it in the long, it's, it's just like, all of a sudden there's Ruth. It's just a, really a cool little book about relationships and submission of authority and a love story and romantic and all that kind of stuff too. But anyway, the book of Ruth opens with Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons experiencing drought and famine in, in Bethlehem. So they leave Israel and they go to Moab. Well, in Moab, the two sons marry Moabite women, and we're introduced to Ruth, who becomes the heroine, so to speak, of the book of Ruth. Well, tragedy strikes his family in Moab, and Elimelech dies along with the two sons. So Naomi now is devastated and 
Rightly so, right? She lost her husband and two sons. And she says to her daughter, lost, you just need to go back to your people. I'm, I'm devastated. I have no more sons for you. Now we're going to hear one of the greatest, grandest articulations of submission in the whole Bible. And it's given by a Moabite woman named Ruth. Listen to what she says to her mother-in-law in verses 16 through 18 of Ruth chapter 1. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her to leave, basically. So that, that is, do you realize how powerful that is? And you know what Ruth did? She put herself in this favorable position so God could bless her. And so these two women head back to Israel, devastated, loss of husbands, sons. It's a devastating kind of picture. And they end up by this man named Boaz. And Ruth gleans in his field a couple times, and Naomi knows that Boaz is a near kinsman redeemer, and he says to Ruth, the man will do right by you. You go to him, and you lay at his feet, and when he wakes, you tell him, cover me with the corner of your robe. <laughs> it's kind of a bizarre tradition, but basically what Ruth was going to request Boaz to do was protect Naomi and me. Take me as your wife. We're, we're without husbands. Do your duty that you should do. Be a near kinsman redeemer. And it's a wonderful picture of what Jesus did for us. As our near kinsman redeemer, he came to us, right? When we were lost and destituted and had no covering, and he covered us by his blood. Amen. Anyway, I'm, I'm diverging from the story. But it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful act of submission on Ruth's part. And the, as the story continues, Boaz did that very thing, and he marries Ruth. It's just a wonderful story all around. And then they have a son, and his name is Obed. He has a son. His name is Jesse. Jesse has a son, King David. And he ends up in the line of Jesus Christ. And so we see this Moabite woman, because she understood the power of submission, she submitted to her mother-in-law, she submitted to Boaz, she submitted to Jewish customs, she submitted to God. He honored her, and she ends up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. She didn't even know all that would happen. She didn't even realize. She died before realizing all that. Amen? And we just see the power of God at work in a submitted life. I just want you to understand this. It goes against basically everything we're taught. We're basically taught to take charge, to be about freedoms, to be about our rights, to voice our opinions. Amen? Amen, aren't we? This goes so against that. I have one more example. This is a little bit more difficult to talk about, but I think it gets at it, and there's a lot of differing opinions on this, and so I'm going to give my version of some things here, uh, at least what I've begin to, uh, or what I understand. Um, our country was really begin as a, as a great act of submission, not a great act of rebellion, and I don't think a lot of Americans know that. Um, the, the original chart was given to those who first came to America, particularly to those of the New England colonies, uh, groups like the Puritans, uh, these companies were granted full executive, legislative, judicial authority. They only had an obligation to remain loyal to the King of England, but they were not under parliamentary rule. And so these folks made their way over here. A lot of us know the stories of them making their way over here. And, and these boats just were devastating. Frequently half the people on the, on the boats died. And then they would set up their, their little, uh, you know, colonies here. And it was just a brutal kind of life. And then the colonies would begin to do well. They begin to thrive. And Parliament had the great idea that government frequently does have. Well, we should tax these guys. Amen, right? And the problem was they weren't under parliamentary rule. So the colonies uh, appealed to the king by petition to intervene in their behalf. And so many people think that America was formed by this rebellious group shucking off the tyranny of England and, and oppression and all that, and out of that rebellion began America. Uh -uh, uh -uh. They weren't a bunch of rebels. Really, they were trying to submit to the king and say, look, you gave us your word, you would protect us, and all that, and, 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 and now they're trying to tax us, and that's not part of the deal. And what pushed the colonies to independence was really an act of the king. 
In October, November of the year 1775, the king proposed and the British Parliament approved the removal of the colonies from their protection. So the colonies were no longer protected by the King of England. In other words, he said, you're on your own. So what did they do? They banded together and said, we got to protect ourselves. And that basically was the birthing of us, the United States. They were trying to submit. The king removed his authority and his right to rule over us. So then we banded together. And that really was what started the, the country out. Now, I want to talk to you in, in, in regards to just one group, uh, the Puritans. Because they really get a bad rap. And I've been reading this book lately again. I read it a long time ago called Light and the Glory. It's really an interesting book about the early history of our, our, our uh, country. And uh, basically, it's the journaling of some of those uh, early people that were there. They basically take their writings and they quote them all over in the book. I said, oh, it's interesting. Just to accurately read what they wrote, not what someone else is interpreting what they wrote. Amen? And so, interestingly enough, when you read about the Puritans, they, they were disillusioned with the church in England because of the corruption. So what they wanted to do was come over here and have the opportunity to have free expression of their church of England and hopefully a, a, a movement of God that they could bring back to England. That was their purpose. And so they came over with this devotion to one another and this high accountability to one another and saying, we're going to live as a true community of followers. Does this sound good? Yeah. And basically in some of those early colonies was... They, they begin to level out the social systems, the caste system, so to speak. There were no gentlemen here that didn't work. We all work. We all pull our weight. We're all equal in God's sight. We all need to contribute to the culture if we're going to survive. And so the Puritans had this really high regard for community and for accountability. But now, if you read about the Puritans, it's used in a derogatory sense. The Puritan name is equated to religious rigor and self-righteousness and religiosity, right? And I was just reading this book again. I'm halfway through it again. And they're, they're saying, just look in culture how their, their name is taken kind of wrongly. And I looked on social media and someone said, don't be so Puritan. I thought, oh my goodness, there it is. They're saying, don't be self-righteous and blah, blah, blah. But the Puritans, when you read about them, they wanted to do a true church of God. They wanted an authentic thing to happen, and they wanted to have true uh, accountability. And, and so it's um, inadequate and incomplete to characterize them as legalistic and self-righteous. But it's convenient if you don't want to hear their story, right, and see what they were trying to do. So anyway, I just want you to understand, even our country was really, some, really more founded on the principles of submission than it was on rebellion, Okay. And that's part of the reason I think God blessed us. Anyway, just my thought. Big thought for today is this. Don't do wrong and give those in authority a real reason to punish you. Okay? Don't do wrong and give them a real reason to, to throw you in jail. That's what Paul's basically saying here. And last week, I noted that the early Christians were falsely known as a seditious group, meaning they were viewed as ones who stirred up trouble and were not submissive to the governing authorities. And Paul in this teaching is basically saying to them, he's saying it to us also, listen, do what is right as far as possible. Obey the laws of the land. Obey the directions of your authority. When you can't because it's a violation of God's law, which may happen, then you have to be willing to undergo the consequences of saying no to that authority and do so in an orderly, submissive manner. That's essentially what Paul is saying here. Now, there are two situations, I think, that we need to address this morning, and we're going to get way, way more practical than we've been so far, and I'm going to talk on some detail with you on some things, okay? And so we're going to talk on two situations. How do we deal with an authority that's good? that's righteous, that's easy to deal with. How do we deal with that authority? And then two, how do we deal with authorities that are bad and ugly, that just aren't very godly? What do we do in that circumstance, okay? So we're going to just boil this down to those two circumstances. Now listen, I want you to do something with me today. It's easy to read the scripture and just make it nationalistic and think about this government thing, that this government thing. Forget that. Right now I want you to think about the one who's immediately over you. How do you treat them? A movement of God usually doesn't begin on a national level. It usually begins locally. Amen? All the great awakenings begin with people just getting on fire for Jesus Christ. So 
we wrongly, we do injustice to this scripture if we just think it's a thing about national government or local government. Think about how you interact with those in authority over your person, whether it be a teacher, a professor, an administrator, a boss, maybe the local civil government. How do we treat these people? Because we can really affect that situation by doing this right and, and by taking to heart what I'm about to share. So here we go. Case number one. You have a, a godly, uh, a good-hearted uh, authority trying to do what's right. Okay, here, here's how, you, how, how, how this situation, I think, should pan out. In the ideal situation, then, where there is no violation of the law of God, the follower of Jesus must follow the directions of the authority. It's pure and simple. Amen, right? If they're not asking you to do anything wrong, what are you to do? You do what they ask you to do, amen? So this could be applied directly to your boss, to a government official, and so on. And really, I'm gonna say this, for us here today, this first situation is most often the case. Most often we have an authority that really isn't asking us to violate any of God's laws. Um, if you're like me and like a lot who read Romans 13, the first thing you begin to do is say, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Stop doing that and say, what could be if I actually do what this tells me to do with my immediate boss over me? Don't throw the meat of this teaching away by what ifs. We do that a lot with scripture, by the way. I know it's unintentional, but we do that a lot. Don't do that with this teaching. What Paul is saying here is this. Don't stir up trouble. Don't be seditious. Don't really do it so there's justification for you being punished. We're to be law-abiding, peace-seeking people. So we're going to talk about two practical uh, guidelines real, real quickly here that apply to, to this situation and also apply to the next point on ungodly uh, leadership. As much as possible, be a person of peace. All right? God has called you to that. Now, we know this was stated for us back in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, where it says this. If it is possible, as much as you are able, as much as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen? So Paul gives us this great, big, huge principle in Romans chapter 12. And then in Romans 13, we're supposed to say, oh, here's an application. As much as possible here, I'm supposed to live at peace with those over me and in authority over me in that kind of situation. If we're really applying this principle then, we're going to do right, we're going to follow the law, uh, and we're going to live at peace with our authority. And I'm going to say this again, most of the time, we can do this. Amen? Listen to this. One commentary said, Christians are not to use their freedom in Christ as a handy excuse for disobeying the laws of the state. I want you to think on that. We're not supposed to use our freedom in Christ as a handy excuse to not obey those in authority, especially when they're not asking us to compromise our Christian faith. We're just not supposed to do that. No matter if the government authority over you is good, bad, or ugly, if you do wrong, then you are to fear because punishment will come your way. I grew up uh, getting in some trouble. Anybody relate to me in that regard? Uh, my mom had a saying whenever I'd come home kind of looking frazzled, she would say to me, what did you do now? implying that I had done something wrong. And about 95% of the time, uh, she was spot on. And so I had this nasty habit of playing with fire, especially when I was 10, 11, 12. I like fire. Anybody like fire? And so uh, I burned our field down by our house twice. I was the source of the ignition that burned that field down that got all the fire trucks out there, putting this field of fire out before it got to the neighborhood and burned the houses down. Well, the second time I did it, um, I knew I was in trouble. I said, oh, rat, I did it again. I remember thinking that. The whole thing's on fire. I'm trying to stomp it out. Finally, I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> it was just blazing like crazy, you know. So I'm running home, and a couple people saw me running out of the field. I said, oh, no, now I'm caught, you know. And I remember hiding in the basement of our house, wondering when I would get in trouble. You see, I'd done something wrong, and I was rightly fearing the government. I was living out Romans 13.5. If you do wrong, you have something to fear. Amen? It's the government's role to bring on us. By the way, they never did catch me. It, 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 I just want to finish the story for you all. It's the government's role to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. But, but my mom was not happy. She said, this has got to stop. And it did stop after the second time when I got really scared. Anyway, so it's the government's role to bring punishment on people who do wrong. This applies to a couple of things. 
First, personally speaking, we never retaliate. We don't have personal revenge kind of thing going on here. We never do that. That's the government's role. Um, in fact, we're supposed to bless those who persecute us. Because when we begin to be the ones who think we need to take vengeance out on somebody, that, that's like a cancer that eats your soul. And it just destroys you from the inside out. And so we're not supposed to take revenge into our own hands. We know that ultimately God will make everything right. Amen? Right? And so we have to leave that into his capable care and trust him to take care of it. Now, part of the role of government is indeed to address wrongs done to people. And we have to trust that they'll do that. And if they don't, they're accountable to whom? God. Amen? That's how this works. Now, remember the wrong perception of Christianity in Paul's time was that it was a seditious thing. And Paul's saying here, don't think for a moment that by sedition, by undermining the government, that you'll change anything. In fact, most likely you'll just come under the punishment of the very thing that you're trying to change. It doesn't work that way because you might be working against the very authority that God has instituted and you're not understanding um, how that authority truly works. This is why I think Paul says in verse 5, Submit to the authorities because they can punish you. That's part of their role. And, and, and then he goes on and says, and do this for conscience sake. And that really got me to stop and think a moment. You know, ground level understanding of authority is I don't do something because I don't want to be punished for doing wrong, okay? That's like basic. You know, I don't do wrong because I fear the punishment. But what Paul's trying to urge us on to us, he always does, is have a deeper, richer understanding of this thing and do this for conscience sake. Um, do, do, do right because of more than fear of punishment. Do right because you understand that by blessing those in authority, I will bless you. Do right because you understand by doing this, you give a good image of who Jesus Christ is to this culture that's far gone from God. Do it because of conscience sake. Have a richer, deeper understanding than merely wanting not uh, to be punished. When you choose to submit to God's authorities, his governing authorities, um, and you do it because it's a morally right thing to do, God is pleased with that. And I'm telling you what, you're going to experience the power of God in your life. I, I preach this message from a lot of practical experience of being under authorities, good, bad, and ugly in my life. There has never been a, a time when I've been sorry about submission to them when I, it doesn't violate God's law. God always blesses. It's always an amazing thing. And it brings you to a deeper, richer understanding of who God is and also witnesses to that authority. I want you to understand this kind of, kind of, I'm saying a lot of things, but I want you to understand this is we were talking about this in staff, and Aaron said something along these lines, and I'm not going to quote him directly because I'm adding all kinds of other thoughts in there, and I don't want you to blame him if you don't like it. Um, just blame me, okay? So anyway, because I think this is just so spot on. Sometimes you can fight political kind of, political kind of battles. In literal pol politics, political things at work, Wherever situation you want to look at politics. Sometimes you can make your life a, a war against these things that are wrong and you think they're wronging you and you don't agree with. And you can win that battle. Maybe sometimes win it. Oftentimes not. But you often lose the war. And you know what you, the war you're losing? The greater call for gospel presence in your life in that situation than for right or wrong or your perceived right or wrong or your rights. So sometimes we can win a war and what we lose is a voice of Jesus into the circumstances. I've been thinking on that a lot. That's a good statement. Yeah, and it doesn't mean you don't do things that you should do. Always do them with the attitude of humility, and you always do them with bringing glory to God as a motivation, right? And we have a country where we're free to say what we think pretty much so anymore. But when we do so, we realize this, I don't think very many true changes ever happen through a political process. I think most of the time, changes happen when the people of God are the people of God. And we're speaking on a different level of life understanding. And we're counting on things like great awakenings and revivals and a movement of God to change culture, not on a political system to change it. All right? So uh, um, anyway, uh, often when I worked at 3M, I'd be asked in an interview process for a uh, promotion, what makes me tick? And I've shared this before. I would frequently share... Uh, Jesus Christ, because that's true. 
And usually that led to awkward silence. And they didn't know what to do with me at that point, so they would say, well, what does that mean? And I'd say, well, I'm glad you asked. Um, it means this, our work is unto Jesus Christ, which means you don't have to harm me to do what's right. I don't need the recognition of men. I'm not a, I'm not a praise seeker for men. Um, I, I work to bring glory to, to my Lord. I'll work to bless you as my authority and to promote you. Um, and it won't be about a self-interest, subtle kind of angle on everything I do. They won't, just won't exist. And they'd always look at me and say, I think that's good. Because they'd never heard that before. It was so foreign to them. But it's true. When we view our authorities like that, it's an entire different way of doing life. And I'm going to tell you with all honesty, I can say this with transparency. This is how I did my job at 3M. This is how I've done my pastorate, too, with those in authority over me. Sometimes I don't agree with them. But unless it violates a clear law of God, all right, I'm going to work for them and, you know, do. And I'm going to tell you something. Oftentimes, you as a Christ follower, you know way more about this topic matter than the one in authority over you. Amen? They won't get it at all. And it, become a, it can become a mighty witnessing tool. Right? Right? Okay. That was really wimpy. Okay. <laughs> so... Here's a second thing to do, practical thing to do. Make it a practice to pray for those in authority. Second um, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 speaks to this plainly. It says this, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. So we followers of Jesus should desire what? Basically for the government to leave us alone. Amen? Amen. We don't want anything from you. We don't want you to support us. We don't want you to take care of us. We just want to be left alone. Amen? Let us live peaceful lives and let us live quiet lives. So what? We can spread the word of Jesus Christ in our culture. That's what we should pray for. We don't want the government to take care of us. We don't want them to give us money. There's all kinds of entanglement with that. We don't want that, by and large. Basically, our prayer should be, just leave us alone. Let us have the freedom to preach the gospel. It's that that simple kind of prayer. And so understand this. Prayer is not a last response when things look like they're really going downhill. Oh, we better pray. (gasps) And there's this fear and this angst and this anxiety. We better pray, we better pray, we better pray. Things aren't going the way. No, prayer here like this is meant to be a first response all the time for all those in authority over us. We battle not against flesh and blood, do we? But against principalities and everything that exalts itself against the name of Jesus Christ. Um, And so make it a practice to pray for your boss. Let's just lose national government thinking right now. Just throw that out of your mind. I know that occupies a lot of people. Who do you work for? Have you been praying for them? If you go to school, do you pray for your professors? Not that you get a good grade. (laughs) Do you pray for their well-being? Do you you have some other kind of authority like that in in your life? Do Do you pray for them? That God would move on their hearts, that he would bless them, that he would fill them with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Pray. It's not a last resort. It's a first response to life. This is how we are called to do our Christianity. All right. So now I've talked to you on this um, situation uh, of good. We're going to move to the bad and the ugly here and finish up the message today. But we're going to begin this part of the message by looking at a little video that will probably get you thinking. Das insbesondere keine mehr dann in Deutschland leben wird, in der Arbeit der Faust minder sehen wird, als in irgendeiner anderen Arbeit. Durch eure Schule wird die ganze Nation gehen. They considered themselves the master race, the prototype of manhood, demigods of power, the only race in whom the divine spark still resided. They strove for the ideal perfection of bodily form, 
Within their mortal bodies flowed the blood of the immortal, the primal Aryan from whom they descended, a figure of myth more so than actual history. With self-idolatry and brute force, they spread across Europe, exterminating all those they considered inferior. Jews, Christians, gypsies, slaves, communists, the elderly, and the disabled. Across the ocean, in the land of the free and the home of the brave, voices of pacifism, neutrality, and isolationism rose. They were the voices of those who had struggled and survived the country's worst economic depression. They were the voices of those who had survived another war, the Great War that was to have ended all wars. They were the voices of self-preservation, the voices of fear. But above the voices rose another. This was the voice of a veteran, one who had seen war and one who hated war. It was the voice of an American, one who wanted to shrug his shoulders and go about his business, believing conflicts thousands of miles away did not seriously affect him. But it was also the voice of a president, one who knew that when peace was broken anywhere, peace everywhere was in danger. It was the voice of a president who, wanting pacifism, but knowing war was inevitable, worked slowly but steadily to aid the Allied cause even before joining the war. It was the voice of a president who, though bound in a wheelchair, would ultimately rise to become a world leader, instrumental in the Allied cause and the collapse of Nazi power in Europe. Hmm. So we looked at this kind of situation, and we admire uh, Roosevelt, don't we? Because he stood against evil, and, and it was strong. But my question is this. I'm going to look at this a little different with you this morning. What do we do with a person like Hitler? What do we do with an authority that's ungodly, that's immoral, that has wrong ideology, who's ugly and bad? What do we do when we find ourselves in that kind of a situation? And so now let's talk on that level of authority for a few moments here. This is point number two in your note-taking guide. In the case of an ungodly authority, it is an opportunity to experience God's working in all things for your good. Let me explain what I mean by this statement. In our former series on Romans that we did a long time ago, we learned a powerful promise from Romans 8.28. A promise that a lot of people plaster on their walls and put on no, you know, cards or whatever and know this really well. But Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those uh, who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we often think, yeah, God, you're working for my good, even in the middle of this thing. And we often don't understand what good means. We can't understand what good means. He works for the good of those, right? That's what it says. What that word good means there is he works to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So what is being said there, in all circumstances, if you're submissive to God, he's working all circumstances to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the good that's being talked about there. So I don't know about you, but troubles in my life are the fertile soil for accelerated growth. Amen? I frequently pray this way. God, I really don't need all these troubles. I can learn without them. Anybody else pray that kind of prayer? I pray that now. As I've gotten older, especially I've gone through some hard things in my life, uh, I can see some things coming. I'm thinking, oh, God, I don't need this. I already know this. Please don't do this. It's a very selfish prayer. But, but frequently, troubles and hardship create in us this vulnerability, this willingness to really look deep inside us and say, what's going on there? And it creates in us more dependence on Jesus. And ultimately, if handled rightly, we look more like Jesus Christ when it's all said and done. So I want to talk with you about the good possibilities that can come out of an ugly or bad boss, okay, or authority in your life. One, you can become more aware of areas of weakness in your own life. So if you're not getting enough encouragement from your boss, if they're taking and, 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 and actually saying slang about you and doing wrong things, and you're getting all mad. Why are you getting mad? What needs to die in you? We don't work for the praise of men. We work for the praise of our Savior. I remember getting passed over a promotion at 3M that I really deserved, and I had a really godly boss, and I was upset because it missed thousands of dollars 
that. And I had done huge projects. And he said, who do you work for? Men or God? I said, well, I work for God, but I'd like the men to recognize that. Because I want the money. I don't care about the other part. You follow what I'm saying? But he, he was right. I was really upset. And I thought, yeah, you're right. I don't work for the praise of men or the recognition of men. I work for the glory of God. Amen? And so sometimes a difficult thing can zoom you right into that. that. Secondly, your behavior can just really encourage others. Man, we don't understand the power of this. When we do right in spite of what's going around us, when we are submissive in, in a God-honoring way, when we don't raise our voice and, and shout, when we don't demand rights. I, I remember having people say to me, especially when I worked in the secular world, they said to me, you never swear. You never get mad. You never demand why. There you go. What do you do? You say why, because I love Jesus Christ. That's all I would say. It becomes, a, it becomes a way to encourage others, which brings us right to point three. You witness then to those around you in that situation. You witness uh, what Christ looks like. It becomes a powerful tool of speaking into the lives of other people. Fourthly, and this is so important, we just bring glory to God. We just bring glory to God. And man, I tell you what, when you look at World War II, and you look at all the oppression that took place, and you read Bonhoeffer, and you read Corey Ten Boom, you read some of the people that went through it and came out of that thing, you're just going, oh, God, you're so amazing. In the middle of all this tragedy, you had these, these I would call them just greats of the faith, just step up, you know, and, and really follow hard after you. And they become this, this uh, grand glory bearers for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then, number five, you can become more like Jesus Christ, which ultimately is the good that we're being talked about here in Romans 8, 28. God works all things for good. We become just more like Jesus Christ. So I want to end today by sharing a story from Peter and the disciples found in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles, Peter and the disciples, are arrested by the high priest and his associates because they're witnessing about Jesus all the time, and so they're thrown in jail. And that night, the Lord comes and supernaturally opens up the jail, and these guys escape, and they're in the temple courts the next morning witnessing about Jesus. So they arrest them again, and they bring them before uh, the high priest and his associates, and they were told not to preach. This is a clear case where you don't listen to your human authorities, amen? And Peter says to them, uh, we must obey God rather than men. Okay, here you go. Clear case. Can't, can't, I can't do what you want me to do because it goes against what God wants me to do. And they share about Jesus to this Jewish leadership, and the Jewish leadership just wants to kill him. But Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, persuaded them not to do this, saying, if you do this, you might be fighting against the very thing that God's about, and then we're fighting God, and if it's not of God, it'll just kind of go away. So they decide, uh, you know, to basically drop the matter. But that doesn't mean that these disciples got away scot-free. There's more to the story. We were simply told they were flogged. That doesn't mean, oh, bad little boy. They were flogged, man, with a cat of nine tails. They got lead balls on the whip, and they're whipping these guys back. You follow what I'm saying here? They're flogged. That's painful. And I think, it's just stated there, and it's such a small thing to read right through and not understand the consequence of that. And then, here's something amazing. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you and I, when we don't have something to go our direction, we go, wah, 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 right, don't we? We get all upset. And I'm thinking, these guys are going, hallelujah, I got flogged. I just want us to think about that for a moment, the difference of attitude and reaction. And we see the disciples, they couldn't do what the authority wanted them to do, so they willingly took the consequence and they rejoiced that God was at work in this thing. And I think that was a grand testimony. They were willing to pay the price for their faith and it was a grow in grace experience. They came away rejoicing and they had an opportunity to suffer. I just want you to think on this and what we go through and our reactions sometimes to what we go through in our day and age, okay? And I pray that we have the grace that these disciples have. Now, our reading in Romans 13 ends with a simple statement, pay taxes. And every time we hear the word taxes in America, we get mad, don't we? 
I mean, people told me, we moved to South Dakota because it's the land of the free. There's no income tax here, right? Right? I mean, seriously. When I came here, I said, I just got a raise. <laughs> well, it's like the best thing ever in my life when I moved here. And I remember that. But listen, Paul simply says, you pay taxes because the ones that govern over you, it's a full-time job, they need to be supported. That's what he's saying here, essentially. <clears throat> you got to remember, he's saying this in the midst of a government that's anti-Christian, it's very punitive of Christ's followers, okay? He's saying pay them taxes because they need to have a support for what they do. Now, Jesus, when asked if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, simply said pay to Caesar what's Caesar and, and to God what is due to God. So I'm going to let you figure this tax thing out for yourself, okay? If you choose not to pay taxes, let me know. I'll visit you in jail, Okay, and bring you the good. I mean, if you really have that conviction, that's what happens. The natural content. A- amen. I mean, all joking aside, you can make those decisions and you can go to jail over them if you want. Maybe God has for you a jail ministry. Amen. So just throwing stuff out there. But Christians, we can't get mad if we don't do what the law says to do because we have a conviction we shouldn't do that or whatever. Okay. We take the consequences and then count on God. Uh, to move in that situation. Um, so I need to quit. Conclusion, God's overall. And the application is simply this. We're back to that big question. How will you put into practice your radical identity in Jesus in order to have a transformative influence on your authorities and others affected by those authorities? Let's pray quickly and I'll turn it over to Kyle. Lord God, I want to thank you for this Romans 13 scripture. It is, as I've shared now for a couple weeks, a concise summary of a big theme throughout the Bible that you move mightily in the lives of those who submit. And frequently they're submitting to ungodly authorities, Lord. And I just see you move so mightily in these biblical examples. What I pray is we take this to heart. You know, Jesus, I, I, I readily acknowledge this before you today. None of this makes sense if you're not a Christ follower. It's a spiritually discerned truth. And I want to pray for anybody in here this morning that doesn't know you, Jesus. Maybe someone listening online is in that category too today. I want to pray that their hearts would be open and receptive to receiving you by faith, Jesus, as their Savior, and then submitting to you as their Lord. And I pray they pray a simple prayer, Jesus, just come in my heart, be my Savior, and I give my life to you, and I come under your Lordship. I just pray that someone pray that simple prayer. And I, I, I pray for all of us, Lord, that the prayer of our heart would be one of submission to you. And then seeing governmental authorities differently, seeing our bosses differently, seeing our teachers and professors differently, Lord, that we begin to see everyone as through that lens of of kind of authority in your your perspective as you laid out in Romans 13, Lord. And I just pray that we would begin to bless authorities and put ourselves into that favorable position of receiving power and blessing from you, Jesus. God, we love you so much. Would you, would, you just, would you just work mightily in the people of Grace Point, whether they're here in person or listening online today? Would you move mightily, Holy Spirit? Would you empower us to, to not just survive, but to thrive in the middle of troubles, that we would cling to you more tightly than we ever have, Lord, that we'd follow after you hard, that we'd read words like we read today in Romans 13 and not throw, out, throw them away, but under, and, and grapple with, how do I do this, Jesus? How do I really do this? And I think in the grappling of the word and then the struggle of trying to apply it and live it out, Lord, that's where we find you and meet you in new and enlightening ways. So just give us this heart of submission, Jesus, I pray, especially to you. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we get ready just to close by singing this last song. Uh, this last song, we're just going to just make this declaration that we turn our eyes towards God. Um, that we don't have all of the answers and that at times, sometimes it doesn't even seem like things make sense, but we know that that God is over all, God is on his throne, and so we praise him, we worship him, and we look towards him for uh, his guidance and direction. So let us just close by lifting up these words together.
look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do. rejoicing that our God reigns um, in the past and today and forevermore. Our God is on his throne. Our God is over all. 
Uh, so we just close by rejoicing in that and just worshiping him. Um, if you're a regular tender, if you'd like to give financially here to the church this morning, um, we've got some back black boxes on the lower and upper level uh, as an option for you if you'd like to give this morning. But go this week um, just rejoicing and praising him, knowing that he is over all. He is a God who is seated on his throne. And we praise him and just want to make the name of his Savior, Jesus Christ, known. Uh, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.